compared to season one, they've actually put more boats in a smaller area and said good luck. Watching the practice racing unfold, there was a high error rate, lots of mistakes. To have the lineup of, of talent that we have now, we haven't seen that for a long, long time, if ever. So that's why we're all so excited to see how this race is going to play out. It's been a long time since we've raced. Everyone's feeling the pressure. This is taking it to a whole new level and a whole new audience. It's going to be some of the most exciting racing people have ever seen. Parkinson's ability to sail the boat on the edge mean four-time Olympic gold medalist Ainsley can work his tactical magic. They start this event here in Bermuda as favourites for me. Searstead has had his team camped out in the cold Danish winter, putting in hours in smaller training catamarans. But how will that translate to the powerful F50? The chat is often about the long game, but they've got to show off some of their pre-event gains in Bermuda. The cheeky Kiwi, Phil Robertson, remains at the helm of the Spanish boat for now. The young guns from Spain may not be household names yet, but with Trittle and Botan already amongst the hottest property at the Olympic sailing scene, they are surely the ones to watch. Billy Besson and his French team need to restart Sail GP season two, having finished last in the season opener. He's stuck with Morvan and his flight controller, and they've got to improve their maneuvers. Their big signing is Lee McMillan, a sailing uh, expert in stadium racing, and I hope his fr French is coming on really well. All change at Japan as Outridge mixes it up. In comes Olympic medalist Chris Draper on wing trim, and Italian sailing hero Francesco Bruni is flying the boat. If this team can gel quickly, Quickly, they will be at the sharp end of the racing. The arrival of Burlingham two in New Zealand has been the most anticipated of season two. They've arrived with a new playbook for their manoeuvres, but it's proving inconsistent for now. When things click, they're going to get going. They're going to move up the leaderboard when they learn the F F50 on sailing's ultimate level playing field. Seismic changes to the USA team. Everyone is off the boat other than Roan Kirby, who has moved to flight controller. The man wielding the axe needs no introduction. Jimmy Spittle is known for his no-nonsense approach, and we look forward to seeing how he adapts to sail GP. Well, USA SEAL GP team helmsman and CEO Jimmy Spithill knows these waters better than most. And moments ago, we caught up with him before race one here at SAIL GP and here in the beautiful waters of Bermuda. Hey, Jimmy, welcome to SAIL GP. Beautiful day out on the water in Bermuda, it looks like. What are going to be the key points for you to focus on today? Yeah, it's a fantastic day. The racetrack looks awesome. Plenty of opportunities out here. I think the focus for us will just be trying to stay clean, just keep the mistakes down and just try and work our way around the course. That sounds good. We're, um, we're pretty excited about seeing eight of these F50 catamarans heading into Mark 1. Be honest with us, any nerves on board uh, the boat there? Oh, it's going to be exciting. Yeah, I think everyone... Not all the teams are looking forward to it. It's the first time we've had this many boats all on the same start line and that first reach. So, yeah, it should be incredible. Uh, I know you always like to uh, play things down for yourself, but who do you see as the team to be other than yourself in this uh, event here in Bermuda? I think it's way too early to say, mate. You know, we've really got to get this day's racing under our belt and just sort of see who, uh, who can get through the cleanest. 
Well, that was a beautifully political answer. Thanks for that, Jimmy. I hope you have a great day's racing and uh, look forward to seeing what you can do. Well, it has been a thundery week here in Bermuda. Spithill and the other teams, I suppose, struggled to get as much training done out on the water as I'm sure they would have liked to have done. But a different feel today, perfect racing conditions. I'm standing on the seawall next to the boat sheds overlooking the race course. And the sunshine is beaming down on the aquamarine clear waters. It's picture perfect. Winds around averaging 26 kilometres an hour, gusting up to 35, coming from the northwest. And it's those gusts that are important as well as any potential shifts. Uh, earlier, defending Sail GP champion Tom Slingsby on the Australian F50. He told me that he thinks it will be shifty at the top of the course, and that's where he says he wants to try and make gains on his competitors. So let's have a look then at the course in more detail with Stevie Morrison. Well, high over the Bermuda Great, Bermuda Great Sound here, the ghost boats are going to show us that there is always more than one option to find the fastest way around the seven kilometre course. There's tactical opportunity at each turning mark. As we follow the boats, the crews will be executing pre-race plans. Two kilometre between the gates, into the wind, it's all about speed and tactics. Four minutes to find more wind and better angle as you progress fastest up the course. Downwind, it's fast and furious. Hold your nerve for the two minute charge down the course. Just 10 minutes after the start and it's last chance for our skippers to gain valuable places and points. No room for error on this stadium course. And it's interesting to look at that on the wind there. Great breeze all over the race course. And I think we can expect gusty conditions at the top of the course, as Ali mentioned. So I don't know if there's a more beautiful stadium setting than we have here at the Great Sound in Bermuda, just outside of Hamilton, as we get set to go with the first race scheduled today of three, as we are now two and a half minutes under. And this is going to be an interesting situation. As you see the Danish team right now, Stevie, it looks like they have all gotten off the boat. Well, two minutes, 19 to go until the start, and I certainly wouldn't want to be alongside my coach boat, but I think they've been having a few issues on board, a few last-minute bits of advice, but good to see they're all on board. Two minutes, yep. 10, they're already going to be into their pre-start routine here. They'll need to be getting around and getting themselves in position. These boats will be wanting to hit the start line on the beer the bang at zero, so they need to be quite quick from here on in. Nikolai Sahestead, one of the new teams here, the helmsman for Denmark Sail GP team. There you see the rest of the fleet. Eight boats with the world's best sailors taking place here in a very small course. That's a lot of talent out there as we come up on 140 to go before the start of race one. Quiet on board the Danish boat there. They'll be in a pre-prepared plan here. If you little comments about the breeze they're trying to watch the best wind but then have already decided where they want to be on the start line at this point great britain sail gp team sir ben ainsley five-time olympian four-time olympic gold medalist running the show there turning turning down here quiet on board the boat Behind, behind, behind. So we won't see a jibe like that in the race. That was a slow speed jibe. Boat looking a little bit jumpy in the water. And that's Ainsley positioning his boat. The fact he bore away suggests he wants what we'd call the lured end of the line. The end of the line to the right hand side of the picture as we look at it, as that's going to get him on the inside coming into Mark 1. He's out the back at the moment, but will he find a gap? The boats are all well lined up. 27 seconds to go, and it's Ainsley and Tom Slingsby on the Australian boat up towards this top end of the start line. Already very tight. Ainsley blocking out Slingsby as Outridge comes in below Ainsley. I love the control that Ben Ainsley has of this start line at the moment, but he's going to have to watch out because Nathan Outridge on the Japanese boat is really pinning him up towards this end of the line. Seven seconds to go. Who's timed it well? The Spanish up at the top of the line, but the boat's turned down towards the line, and from nowhere, Tom Slingsby's found a gap in the middle of the line. Brilliant starts and it's Slingsby on board Australia with a beautiful start out of the middle of the line can he hold off the fast charging Spanish as we sprint towards mark number one these F50 catamarans over 80 kilometers an hour A 
beautiful overhead shot of the entire fleet. And Sail GP is underway here in Bermuda. This is going to be a key as they come up on Mark 1. Remember, seven legs in this first race. It's tight into Mark 1, but the Spanish look like they may have just snuck forward. No, Slingsby holds control into Mark number 1. Millimeters in it as he rounds here. And Billy Besson on the inside with the French boat. These boats all line up now around Mark number 1. And it's about setting up into downwind mode. Good boat speed. And you're looking at the lured marks already. We're already preparing for these fast approaching lured marks. But what we will like is to be in Tom Slingsby's position. As he approaches the boundary, he's going to have right of way here. Let's listen in. Big moment on board the Australian boat there. We saw the boat lose control as he went into the jive. Poor drop there. There's going to be a penalty for Australia, penalty for Spain for going outside the boundary. They need to lose two boat lengths, but that was a bad boat handling manoeuvre by the Australians. Was he pushed off the course by the French? And meanwhile, New Zealand going to the inside. It was Great Britain and Ben Ainsley that made the first maneuver. And Stevie, that was a major mistake for the Australians after they had that lead. He doesn't seem to be able to get the boat under control. Something wrong when the board dropped down. It was tight with the French, but it's Besson who's come out of that with the back. No penalty for the French. He clearly dealt well, and he should now be set up for a smooth rounding at this lure gate. But look how tight these first four boats are. And New Zealand coming in with the right of way on starboard. All the other boats must stay out of Berlin's way. Hold on to your hats, folks. Oh, tight rounding there. The Spanish came out of that the best. They weave their way through there. Very tight situation. Brilliant work by Phil Robertson. But it's the French, Billy Besson, the Spanish in second. New Zealand and Peter Burling up to third, and Jimmy Spittle, I'm not sure where he came from, but in fourth. Well, what a moment in the race there. These are some of the people we did not expect to see at the front of the race performing brilliantly. So if you like those first two legs, welcome to Sail GP. It's like eight Ferraris going into the carpool lane and everyone looking for the best spot. And problems on board as France gets a little loose. Big mistake in the tack there, Todd. Yes, flying the boat out of the water. We can see this first lap. The boats are so close and you can't choose when you manoeuvre very easily. You've got to be able to manoeuvre these boats perfectly and in these gusty winds, nothing's easy. Watch out here. Spain and Australia, tight cross, right of ways with Australia. Spain potentially going to have to drop behind. So it's Spain that dips below as they try to cross the fleet. And look at this, Australia with the penalty. So they'll have to absolve that penalty. Meanwhile, it's USA, France, and Japan out in front. And look at this change of leadership. Look how tight it is, Todd. Four boats within millimetres as they move up the course. The ladder rung here. It's going to come down to the detail of the manoeuvres at this stage. Freddy Carr, it's all really tight early on in this race. It was very interesting looking at the tack out on that boundary. I was looking at France, USA out on that boundary, and I was looking at the bottom speed, and the French had a bit of a sticky tack. They went down lower than the, with their bottom speed than the Americans, but they're locked together in this drag race for first place. It's really, really tight. The French are going to have the tack on the boundary. Jimmy Spittle's done a nice job. I think for me at this point on this upwind leg, Fred, I'm trying to find a bit of space. Can I sail the boat as quickly as possible? Can I make those tacks? Look at the French. They're in now for their not having the manoeuvres quite perfect. Once again, that's two out of two tacks where they put the boat in the water. You've got to be up on the foils like the Americans are here. Keep the boat going fast. So, fellas, you hear all the talk on board. It's going to be one and in. It sounds like Spittle's pretty happy with his position right here as they come up on leg four. I think when you're listening on board these boats, if the conversation is based in the future, that's about a, that's a boat sailing well. Jimmy Spittle, one manoeuvre, and then he's going to be looking at coming into the gate. But it's Billy Besson, the French crew, somewhat upset in the form guide here. He's found a good shift in the wind. He's progressed up the course fastest. That's a big game for Besson. Bad tack, but tactically very strong. The boat's are going to split the course here at gate number two. It's the French still leading the fleet away of the first race here in Bermuda. Great action. Three, two, one. 
Initial front slide. Initial front slide. Top coming. Keep that rudder in siege. And the Americans doing a great job under the guidance of Jimmy Spithill, their helmsman, Rome Kirby, flight control. And guys, that was a perfect maneuver around that mark. They kept it up on the foils and did not dip either hole. Todd, I'm now dialed into the data coming off the Oracle Cloud, and I'm looking at the, the fly height of the boats. Effectively, the higher the boat is out of the water, the faster it's going to go. But the higher the boat is out of the water, the more out of control they are. Well, we just saw in the background Ben Ainsley and the British crew. They fell off the foils. Besson, top of the screen, he's come off the foils. If any of these boats can stick a few good manoeuvres together, they're going to progress up the fleet very quickly. These gusty winds are proving challenging for the crews to control the boats. It's the best sailors in the world. They're on equal boats, but it's not giving us an equal performance at the moment. How smoothly can you fly the boat? Jimmy Spittle looks like he's got it locked in there, but it's the French coming across from the right-hand side of the screen who have the right of way. It's going to be tight as we approach the bottom. Jimmy Spittle's going to just want space, and he would like a left turn out of the bottom here. So leg four of seven. Basson has got to be the surprise in this race, guys. Coming to this, he was just hoping to get himself a good position, and if they can get a win, this would be huge for the momentum of Billy Basson in France. Right away with the French here. Tight moment in the race there. A lot of water over the French boat. The French still leads. Spittles misjudged that ley line, getting out the way of the French. And look how slow he is right now as he rounds the mark. Billy Besson, it's messy on board, but he's putting the boat in the right position. Tom Slingsby up into third place, but charging past Spittle here. And the Spanish coming round in fourth. This is an incredible sail GP race we're seeing as a season opener here. And at the moment, here we go. French into attack. Freddie, I think I've been criticising the French tax a bit. That was actually a great tack on the boundary there, Freddie. Yeah, it's a real nice tack. It almost looked like a roll tack. The voice you're hearing there, the British voice on the French boat, is of Lee McMillan. And what I like there, he's live coaching the lads around the race course. He's making sure that every manoeuvre is better than the last. I think as we move up the course here, it's all about spotting the wind ahead, trying to find the gusts coming down. Now, you can't see the wind, but you can see the wind hitting the water. It presents itself as slightly darker patches, and the crews, if they can find more wind, they're going to sail the boat faster, and you progress up that race course quickest. That's all that matters, getting to the next mark before the next boat. So here's the situation on hand on leg five of seven. The French have the lead. Tom Slingsby, Australia sitting in second place, the defending champions in Sail GP. And the Americans who were sitting in second are now sitting in third. Great camera angle there. We can see the French to the left of the screen. The water looks a bit lighter to me. There's left wind. Jimmy Spittle and Nathan Outridge over on this side. They're in a dark patch of water as we look at the screen there. They will be going faster. Look, they're up nearly at 60 kilometers an hour. Expect a gain for Spittle and Outridge. Outridge is renowned for finding the wind. He's the wind whisperer. Great in shifty conditions. And perhaps his boat isn't being sailed as well as it could yet. But he's going to look for these opportunities on the course. And as we were talking about the French learning on the job, their manoeuvres have got better throughout this race. Their bottom speed in, in that tack was 42 knots compared to the Australian at 35. Wow, another close crossing with the Americans and the Australians as the Americans have to give way to the Australians who sit in second, and it's still France out in front. Here 
here we go. That yellow line there signifies the ley line for the next gate. So we're getting towards the closing stages of the race here. Not a lot of opportunity to make your move. Probably only three minutes of racing left. If the French can execute this next bear away well, and a good jive there in the box seat to win the first race here in Bermuda. Tight race though, but I think the French with good control can go well. Tight cross for Australia and the, Austra and the USA team. Who's going to get round second? It's Slingsby. Great work from Slingsby and the battle for third, fourth and fifth. It's going to be tight with Ainsley on a charge as he approaches here. Tight with the USA. Oh, nearly a capsize on board the British boat there. Ben Ainsley at the last moment spins it inside Jimmy Spittle. No oh, penalty on board the British boat as well. He came too close inside Jimmy Spittle. Put the boat on the edge. Ainsley pushing to the limit, but pushing too far. There you see the red light flashing on the back of the boat of Sir Ben Ainsley. They will have to drop back two boat lengths, so that gives that position back to the Americans as they will slow up. Meanwhile, France and Australia on the other side of the course having their own battle for first and second. This is the final downwind leg, and look at the speed difference. The French, here we go, back on board with the British crew here. Watch this late last minute tack into here, and the wing just doesn't pop. The main wing sail needs to change sides. It doesn't facing the wind the wrong way and blows over. Huge moment in the race, but look in the background. Tom Slingsby, 75 kilometers an hour to 65 for the French. The charging Australian moves through into the lead. What a time to take the lead at this stage here. We're coming downwind, Slingsby into the lead, and it's going to be tight on the boundary. The British still with a penalty to get rid of. Jive inside the boundary limits. The other boats must give them room. Uh, yeah, right, okay. Okay, stand by. One, put down. Oh, no! Five, five! Turning. Three, 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 two. Yeah, I'm up. One, one, one. That's your back. Look! Coming up. Two, one. My right. Great last jibe there by the Australian crew and Tom Slingsby. And as we close in at the finish, we can see it's tight in the fleet behind. But at the right moment in the race, when it matters, Tom Slingsby defending Sail GP champion from Australia, bringing the boat home. He was in fourth early on in the race, but he's moved through the fleet very impressively. And race one, what a start for the Australian crew. Fantastic action. And in the background, well, they were given a bit of pressure before the start. They needed to perform, and my word, allez les bleus. Billy Besson crosses the line in second place. What a performance for the French crew. Outerage from nowhere. Here he comes into third place on board the Japanese boat. What a race. But it's the Australians, the defending champions from last year, that get the win. You called it perfectly, Stevie. They were in a bad place early on, and they found a way to get into third. They had a battle with the Americans. Then they got past the French to grab the win in race number one, as Jimmy Spithill will not be happy with that performance. They were sitting in second place. They drop all the way back to fourth. But you've got to think on this first race, and remember, there's two more to go, Stevie and Freddie, that Great Britain's got to be the biggest losers on this one. Big moment there, Ben. We haven't seen mistakes from him, really, and he pushed it in hard. The Kiwi crew here coming through in sixth position for Peter Burling. Well, first race in Sail GP, used to winning. He's got a bit of work to do after that one. They won't be happy, but really won't be happy. Sir Ben Ainsley and the British crew, they've got themselves right back in the race, and it looked to me like a slightly last-minute decision. Didn't get the wing pop right in the tack, and the boat nearly tipped over. And for the pleasure, got themselves a penalty. What a race. So now it's an opportunity for everyone on board to check things over, have a quick debrief, but not a lot of time to make many changes because it is getting ready now for race number two. But for the Australians, they've got to feel really good about what they accomplished today on the Great Sound. Great work there by that Australian crew. And really, Freddie, they just got themselves sailing the boat nice and smooth later on in the race. 
Yeah, they had a cracking downwind. They were always there or thereabouts amongst the race in the top three. And that last downwind, they did a jibe on the right-hand boundary as you look upwind, did a better jibe than the French and burnt over the top of them. But kudos to the French. What a fantastic race from those guys. Great race, wasn't it? I think that's going to be a thing for today, Todd. How well can you execute your tacks and your jibes under pressure? And that's the big question is, how do the France do in race number two and three? The France team, wow, they were sensational early on, but it's Australia that gets the win. The defending champions, Tom Slingsby, the Olympic gold medalist, nine-time world champion, America's Cup winner, and of course, defending that Sail GP Cup. Tom, Freddie Carr here, wonder if you can hear me. What a cracking start to Bermuda. You popped out the middle of the start line, a brilliant way to open your account. Yeah, it was a great start for us. Uh, we uh, got a good start and then we're in a real, real battle to uh, to sort of stay in that front pack. But uh, fortunately for us, we So we'll continue uh, we to work on the communications to, to Tom to, uh, Slingsby on board. Through and overtake on the last run. And that first jibe looked a little bit tricky, mate. It wasn't the ideal jibe, but you hung in there and then an amazing last downwind against the French. Yeah, the first jibe was uh, a shocker. We, uh, we popped the, the windward rudder out, which sort of meant we lost flight control and uh, had a bit of a crash, but recovered. And yeah, the last run with the French, it was, we were ripping down there. We're on our light air boards, but we're still doing 45, 46 knots. So it's pretty impressive. Hey, unbelievable racing, mate. All the best for race two. Thank you very much. So Australia gets the win in race number one. Still to come, races two and three from the great sound here in Bermuda. LGP, you've got the best sailors, the fastest boats, it's in intense pressure. Everyone's got the same gear and it will come down to the best team on the water. The inaugural race of Sail GP, a seminal moment as the event is launched in one of the most iconic settings of all here in Sydney Harbour as they race around Shark Island. And fittingly, the colours of this inaugural Sail GP in Sydney are green and gold. Welcome to Sail GP San Francisco. The wind is building and so is the expectation. You're, you're under pressure the whole time. And so any tiny weakness and you're going to be exposed. You get off the boat, let's go race. It's oh, oh, very right. close to contact. Tom Slingsby, oh, oh, you've just yeah. won here in San Francisco. Oh, boy. Welcome to race one, Sail GP here in New York City. Japan to win here in New York City. Helming an F-50 is probably one of the most difficult boats in the world to help. There it is, for Team Australia, awesome job. Australia is the 2019 Sail GP champion. And it's Great Britain who take victory of 2020. This season, it's without a doubt going to be the toughest one. I think we're going to see multiple winners because we have the best guys in the world. But that's why we compete. You want to test yourself against the best. An amazing first race of three here in Bermuda. And if you're a fan of Australia, you are very happy as Australia Sail GP team gets the win. Tom Slingsby comes from behind to grab the 10 points and the win. Two more races still to go as we take a look at the highlights with Stevie of race number one.
Well, the race was spectacular from the start. 18 seconds to go, and we can see Australia's Tom Slingsby stuck out the back. But so often these starts are all about opportunism. And with Outridge focusing on Ben Ainsley in the middle of the line, a gap opened up for Tom Slingsby. Now it's about time and distance. Three seconds to go, and the boats are holding for that perfect trigger pull. Here he goes, Tom Slingsby turns the boat for the line. He's over 64 kilometers an hour, 65, crossing the line there. It was Australia and Tom Slingsby out the middle of the line. Opportunist start for Slingsby and a classy start from Besson on the French boat as well. It was Australia, Spain and France that really executed that start well. But I think we're gonna see that in this eight boat fleet. You're gonna need to be an opportunist. And along here, you need to be brave. How fast are you willing to push? As we come round the mast, we can see there over 80 85 kilometers an hour as they head downwind here and Tom Slingsby mentioned in his post-race interview he flew the boat a bit high got a little bit loose but he's famous for that drive it like you stole it Tom Slingsby that's how he loves to sail the boats right on the edge but when it goes wrong that can happen too high rudder pops out the water and look at that there's white water all the boat and the boats go sailing past him that was a big mistake but the French crew, well, they had a lot of pressure before the start, but under pressure, you can see how tight they were at several races here. Moments in the race, they were so tight, white water over the boat, but Besson, he stayed calm. The Frenchman stayed calm. Freddie Carr was talking to us about Lee McMillan's addition to the boat. Bit of calm and doing a nice job. Well, he's a man of few words, but many medals. New Zealand skipper Pete Burling joined Sail GP off the back of winning his second America's Cup, leading a team of his country's top sailors, including lifelong sailing partner and winning trophies, Blair Took. Burling might not say it himself, but he's one of the most successful athletes. His impressive trophy cabinet contains both silver and gold Olympic medals in the 49er class, an incredible nine world championship wins, a round the world podium finish, and two back-to-back -back successful America's Cup campaigns. They probably have the right to be called the best sailors in the world at the moment. Eight F-50s on the line, which are the same, and that's going to be who can set the boat up differently, who can sail the boat better, more accurately, and it'll be really interesting to see if they can do that in this class. They are exceptional sailors, and I'd say if there's a rivalry in sailing that I have, it's more with Peter than it is with Tom. So I'm really looking forward to getting back on the water and racing against Pete, and I think Saji P's going to be a pretty tough event to win moving forward. The fly the Kiwi flag is uh, something we're really, really proud of. An incredibly passionate Kiwi and I you know, really love representing you know, our home nation. Just looking forward to, to giving that best crack and uh, hopefully doing our country proud. You know, I think something that gave us a lot of you know, confidence coming into this event was you know, how quickly Ben picked it up. You know, we should be able to learn just as quick if not quicker than anyone else. It's incredibly important to have a team that you trust 100%. Blair and myself have obviously done a lot of sailing together and you know, I think that definitely helped us. We're pretty fortunate that uh, most of us on board the boat have raced together since we were, we were really young. You know, it's really uh, you know, a team sport in these things, so it's you know, about everyone on the team, not just two people. And both Burling and Chuk, very familiar with these waters in Bermuda, the Great Sound, because they won the America's Cup here, of course, in 2017. Many of the sailors familiar with this stretch of the water. That inside knowledge, so important. The weather then forecast for 26, around 26 kilometres an hour. Average wind gusts up to 35. But actually, standing here on the seawall, it feels like the wind has built ever so slightly after that first race. Uh, we saw in that first race just how important um, being able to read the weather out on the course, all the difference that that can make. With Tom Slingsby catapulting himself into the lead, finding those small pockets of breeze. So expect the same in race two. We've got flat waters, we've got plenty of wind, we're gonna have some good fast sailing. So more of the same coming up in race two. Well, they get set now for race number two of three scheduled here on day number one. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot to fight for here. So Australia draws first blood as the defending champion, but lots of rivalries out on the water. Do we, do we have something I can clean this with? 
greatest Olympic sailor of all time uh, is coming on board with the Great Britain Sail GP team. Welcome to Ben Ainsley. To have a circuit in such incredibly high performance F50 foiling catamarans and to bring the best sailors in the world together, yeah, how could you not want to be involved with that? I believe I'm the best sailor in the world at the moment. There's no one I'm intimidated by. And the guys I have behind me, I know that that's the strongest team in the world. I think we'll prove it. And what an advantage this is. Tom Slingsby has it all to do here. On the runner. What's the right, what's the right? Fire right, Tommy. Yeah, full speed in. Uh, not good. I mean, Ken, Ken lay right, but I think he's going to have to go left. Yeah. The Australians now over 400 metres adrift. Two, one, straight. Your wing. My wing. Right. And it's Great Britain who take the first victory of 2020. That was embarrassing for me to have Ben Ainsley come to Sydney on Sydney Harbour and, and we were the favourite team and he, he smoked us. I don't ever want to lose to Ben Ainsley. Actually, the last two metres, I enter early. No one ran. It's really interesting when you talk about rivalries. This this fleet is now packed with absolutely the best, you know, inshore sailors in the world. We've now got the who's who of yachting out there. I've raced with a lot of these guys, you know, raced against a lot of them. Uh, they're, they're all rivals, they're all the best in the game. Ben Ainsley, uh, Jimmy Spithill, uh, Blair Tuke, Peter Burling, Francesco Bruni, uh, there's no one who's missing anymore. So you want to be every single one of them. It's not really that you, you single out one individual, one team that you have to beat. You've got to beat them all. I've always competed with Jimmy Spithill and competing against him will be fun, but he's not the person I want to beat so much. It's, uh, it's Ben Ainsley. Ben kind of made us, myself and the Australians, look pretty stupid last time we raced. We've got a great team. We proved that in the only event we've sailed in in Sail GP in Sydney. Uh, for the first time sailing together as a team and, and back in the F50s, you know, we went pretty well. I've had 14 months to think about it and watch replays and we didn't show up that day. Ben did and I want to see who, who the better team actually is. So day one Bermuda Sail Grand Prix presented by Hamilton Princess rolls on and we are less than a minute 40 away from the start of race number two conditions. As Al reported, looks like the wind may be building just a little bit and the pressure now has been applied as Australia draws first blood that if any champions get the win in race number one, two more races on the day. Freddie, Stevie, this is going to be a really great race and someone's going to seize control of this thing. Yeah, and the start is all important, Todd. As we know, I've looked back at start one. The three boats that got to mark one first were the fastest boats when the gun went. That sounds obvious, but it's hard to pull off. We are attacking. Yep, crossing GBR. I think the wind in will be a little bit more favoured this time than before. Standing by the tank. Going board. Good comms there from Nathan Outridge. He talked about the windward end of the line being favourite. That's the line, that's the end of the line to the left of our screen as we look at it. That's the angle fastest to the next mark, to mark one. So Outridge wants to be at that end and don't think he's the only person in the fleet that's going to know that. 30 seconds to go to the left of the fleet is Nathan Outridge, the white boat with the red flashes on the wing there. He's definitely positioned himself up there and his long-term rival Burling. It's going to be a fight for this windward end of the start line with just 19 seconds to go. Who can get the boat up on the foils? It's Outridge at the windward end, and at the bottom end of the line, it's Ben Ainsley, but it's all about timing now. Who's going to hit the line fastest? It's going to be Tom Slingsby inside, but Outridge, he's where he wanted to be. There's three seconds to go. He's up and foiling. He's where he wanted to be. What execution from Nathan Outridge, and there he goes. Outridge off the line fastest. Tom Slingsby was aggressive at the bottom end of the start line, but is Outridge, Outridge right? He wanted that end of the line he's got it and it's spittle out the back with a penalty as we blast towards mark number one it's a test of speed right now 
Now what a great shot as the entire fleet heads to mark number one. You saw the helicopter overhead, the beautiful waters of Bermuda, and it is on race number two from Bermuda. Mark one, it's Australia and Tom Slingsby in the lead. He went so fast across there. I gave Outridge the start, but it was Slingsby that sailed fastest across there. Slingsbury and Outridge, where have we heard that before? The two Sail GP veterans leading round mark number one, and they streak away downwind. Third place for Sehested of Denmark, and Besson once again in the mix in fourth. It's a good start to race two, and the boats will already be preparing for the choice of Mark to take at gate number two. You've always got an option there, left or right. They'll be looking for wind, looking for opportunity. Good work there from the Australian crew. It's interesting you heard Jason Waterhouse come in in the middle there. He's the flight controller to jibe one of these boats. It's not one person on its own. It's four or five of them all over each other talking. How can we help each other? How can we get it round? And now great camera angle. I see wind for a left turn. No surprise to see Slingsby taking the left turn. Trying to keep it simple, but he's trying to find more wind. Outridge, no fall, follows him round. They've all got their head out looking for wind. And Freddie, it looks pretty good on the right hand side of the course to me. It looks really good on the right hand side where the Australians and the Japanese are heading. The wind is shifting around a little bit though Stevie. You can see the angles of the mark exits are varying a lot across the fleet. It's all about wind speed to get yourself going faster or wind direction to sail a shorter distance. They're always your options. Either one can help you progress up the course fastest. And Sir Ben Ainsley, well, he turned right. He obviously saw something a little bit different. And we're going to see how that tactical play works out for him, Fred. And I'm looking at the wind coming off the Australians on the right-hand side and the wind coming off the British boat on the left-hand side. And they are a little bit softer on the British boat, but they have got clear air, sort of non-disrupted air to sail in. So the race course is open for the British. So it's Australia out in front here, leg three of seven. Japan sits in second, Denmark up to third, and the Americans who finished fourth in race number one are currently sitting in seventh. The start of these races are so crucial, and Spittle had a problem. He had a penalty at the start. He had to hold back behind the fleet, and that's put him on the back foot. It'll be interesting to watch him progress through this race as out in front, Tom Slingsby, well, he said he's the best yep. sailor in the world and he feared no one, and rightly so at the moment. New yep. position there, he's keeping himself Step low on. in the boat for windage, and here they go, into attack yep. Yep. to cover Building. the fleet. Well, and guys, that was a thing right. of beauty right there. Look how they kept the holes up and out of the water. Just a small splash right there, but their speeds still yep. hovering right. right around 45 right. kilometers right. or an hour, now approaching 50. Yeah, those maneuvers do slow you down, Todd, yep. but the Australians, that was a solid move. It's hard in these gusty winds. You never know exactly what's coming, but again, eyes forward of the boat. You can see the best wind coming, and look at that, Freddie. Australians, all of them low in the boat. Yeah, and the reason they're low in the boat is they're not moving the, the wing as much as the other boats behind them. They're playing the wing twist, which is the back bit of the wing. I'm looking at the numbers here, and the Australian wing twist is moving non-stop versus the Japanese and the British. Gate number three coming up here, and the Australians, look at that lead. Over 120 metres ahead at this stage, that yellow line on the screen symbols the ley line. This should mean the last move into the gate here, and if I'm that far ahead, I'm very keen to try and keep things, keep things simple. That's easy for me to say. I expect a left turn from Tom Slingsby and his Australian crew here, and a good chance to extend away on this next downwind leg. Hey, taking some runners off. Go me. Bearing away in two. One. Bearing away. Yeah, both. Yeah. Another masterful maneuver by Tom Slingsby in Australia. Remember, they won race number one, so they already picked up the 10 points, the max. Japan sits in second right now, and this race, guys, different than we saw in race number one. Really spread out a little more. Here we go. 
Well, good rounding by the Japanese there. I love the communication coming off the boat. In this gusty condition, communication is key, Todd. You've basically got one guy driving the boat, one guy on the wing, one guy foiling the boat. If you don't communicate well, it's going to go wrong. And these top boats are doing a great job. Middle of the pack, Denmark third place, Spain in fourth. And Sir Ben Ainsley, he's back in fifth. He will not be used to that. Not a lot of the race left. We're halfway through this race now as we come down with. What have you seen out there, Freddie? I was just looking at the data for that first All upwind. Right. Not only were the Australians right sailing faster than anyone else, but they sailed the shortest distance up that beat. Uh, I yeah. think that's good. No. Good good info there. No, the guys have got to have their head out of the boat. And we've got Tom Slingsby giving us a private no, run down this right leg. Left. Yeah, trying to get some depth. Pressure doesn't look great. But I remember that from my first sailing when I was with yeah. my dad. You've always got to know where the mark is. Can. And that's Tom Slingsby and Carl Langford having that same yeah, chat at 40, 70 kilometres an hour on a downwind. Just how comfortable were they there? Yeah, Just pointing go. out the marks, looking around, totally in control of that vessel. Okay. Going max dip in two, one. Max dip, turning up, two, one, turning up. Turning up there, that's Tom Slingsby in Australia in the lead, and he's only extending away here. It's a masterclass from Slingsby, Langford and Waterhouse there. They're sailing this boat smoothly. Again, look at that dark patch of water they're sailing back towards there. He's seeing this course like a simple playbook, and he's putting it all together very well. The Spanish up to third, Sir Ben Ainsley. Here he comes in fourth, but in the background, he's flying a little high out of that jive. Not his best work. Boat down in the water again as they slow up. The British are struggling with their manoeuvres, and it's all happening at the back of the fleet here as Sehested comes charging around the outside, and he's up to third. Problems on board the British boat as the leaders streak away. Ainsley's not going to like what he sees there. So after gate number three, Australia's lead was 18 seconds. On gate four, it went up to 21 seconds. And you're right, Stevie, look at this. Problems on board for Sir Ben Ainsley as they've got both holes in the water, barely moving, and they are just giving away positions as Denmark, Spain, and now the USA and France get past them. The grinders all hate it when you've got to work that big wing sail back in the boat when it splashes down like that on fill of water, takes a bit of clearing to get back up on the foils, and in the blink of an eye from fourth back to seventh, Sir Ben Ainsley faces an uphill struggle here look at that great britain sir ben ainsley seventh peter burling and new zealand in eighth that's two of the this greatest the sailors on the planet Denmark. boundary penalty clear boundary penalty now clear well that was a boundary penalty given by the umpires there that's a simple mistake for the danish unforced error but at the moment things are spreading out a little bit ahead this and it'll be interesting france, what freddie penalty. says there france, do the boats penalty. manage to penalty push clear. ahead and sail clean as freddie talked about on that last upwind leg should be easier for the leaders fred there's two loops on board the boat there's the boat speed loop where they're trying to get the boat ripping through the water as fast as possible and there's the tactical loop when we're talking about the tactical loop that's how they get the boat around the course on as short a length of time as possible using the wind and at the moment the australians are doing both of those really nicely doing a fantastic job and and in the background that nathan outridge chris draper francesco bruni Bit of a joke, called him a bit of a dad's army, potentially, Fred, but that's a team with an awful lot of experience. They're new to it, but what a performance in only race two with only a few hours in the boat together. We knew that Nathan shook it up after Sydney and brought on Chris Draper and Italian sailing hero Francesco Bruni, and they've got to grips with these boards really quickly, and they seem to have the boat pretty dialed in there, looking really level in terms of the platform. And when the platform is level like that and just out the water, it's going pretty quick. Great to see. Nothing you like to hear more than lifting pressure. Nathan Outridge there. That means the wind's turning you towards the mark, shortening your distance. The wind whisperer Outridge at it again. But I think what's noticeable is Outridge is doing a great job of giving his crew a commentary, sailing around the course fast as we approach gate five and Tom Slings be in the lead. Okay, adding rudders. Might not make it let us want it in here. 
So Slings be in control of this race. 18 second lead at gate number three. Went up to 21 seconds at gate number four. And as Japan comes around and Nathan Outridge, it's now 24 seconds. So he's adding three seconds, guys, almost every gate. But Thomas Slingsby, really, this race started at the very beginning with him getting an amazing start. Well, this is the two boats that had the two best starts, Todd. There'll be no coincidence there. We'll get analysis from that from Freddie Carr, I'm sure, as things goes on. And what's noticeable, six, seventh and eight, Spitter, Ainsley and Burling. Who thought they'd see that on sale, GP? But at this level, if you make mistakes, if you start behind, it's not going to be easy. And streaking away, as you said, Tom Slingsby and his Australian crew, look how smooth things look on board there, Fred. Yeah. Really locked in, and you can see how static the wing is. It's not moving in and out as we've seen traditionally with the first versions of these wings. It goes to show you how far the technologies come in between season one and season two. These wings really are a fantastic bit of kit. You can be so dynamic with how you trim them. A massive step forwards. Might have to do a coffee. So we'll be both boards down. Yep. And if you clean the wing sheet, come back. Okay, let's do it now. Stand by. Complex move coming up here for Australia. They're talking about two boards down, two quick Three, turns. Let's two, see if they can execute the non-standard manoeuvre. This is the umpire's uh, Denmark boundary penalty. Denmark boundary penalty. So Denmark, their second boundary right. penalty here in the last Denmark two legs. And we'll see if that costs them a position with the Americans sitting right behind well, them in six. Not that was not a move of beauty there, Todd, I'm afraid. They really made a bit of a play of that, Australia. I think they were using it as practice far enough ahead to use that as practice. And the Australians looking so good from the very start of this second race here at the Bermuda Sail Grand Prix presented by Hamilton Princess. It will be that if any champions, Tom Slingsby, Australia Sail GP team, taking the first two races here in Bermuda. Nice work, boys. Coffee, coffee, black boys. <laughs> oh, yeah, lattes all day. <laughs> Whoa, look at the Spanish crew there rounding up at the mark. Have they saved it just about? Oh. What a rounding. Such a near miss as they come in in third place. Regain your focus, Phil. Need to get the boat to the finish. Struggling to get back on the foils. Can the Spanish get this boat back under control in time? Because Billy Besson and the French, they're coming at them fast. And the Danish sneak round the mark in fifth place. This is tight as we come towards the finish. The French team, Billy Besson in fourth. The Danish oh, no. leap up out of the water, nearly losing control. This sprint to the finish. We thought it was going to be a simple leg, but nothing but. Who's going to get there in third place? Looks like the Spanish are going to cling on. It's the Spanish and Besson flying into the line. There he is, Phil Robertson in third. Billy Besson in fourth. Well, that gave us a bit of unspoken drama at the end of things there, Tom. <laughs> Who would have thought the very last leg would be the most exciting with the win already determined and it will be Denmark getting the next position in fifth just ahead of Team USA. Well, look at that at the back. USA finishing there in sixth. So Ben Ainsley in seventh. Well, there's going to need to be some serious evaluation. These two crews, the USA and the British, have probably got two of the great coaches. Robbie Wilson with the British, Philippe Presti. Jimmy Spittle made a point of stealing him from the Australian crew. They're two of the great coaches in sailing. It's going to be interesting to see what they can do between races because there need to be changes on board those two boats. Let's have a look at this turning here from, was it Spain that got your heart rate going? Just the wing doesn't go out there, Todd. The big wing sail, it's as if it's in the cleat or something sticking it in the middle. When you get around that mark, you need to let the wing sail out. Otherwise, that's going to happen there. So that's Florian Trittle, the wing trimmer on board there. He's a young Spanish guy. He's hot property in uh, Olympic sailing. Be interesting to find out afterwards. Was that a mistake by him? Or, well, we'll see who gets the blame for it. But that was an <laughs> error.
And we talked about how high tech these wings had got, and we've heard from the training that they've been doing in Bermuda that the guys are really struggling to get around the control of these new powerful wings. And I think that's what we saw here, Stevie. The wing pop might have been a little bit out of time, and they just struggled to ease the wing sheet down. They needed to depower at that precise moment. Luckily for them, they didn't capsize, and they held on to third place. I think I put that on Florian Trittle, but he was actually on the other side of the boat running across, so that could have been the issue. The choreography of the manoeuvres on these boats is very complex, constantly evolving. We saw that tricky little Australian manoeuvre at the bottom of the leg there. So these teams, they're progressing all the time. So maybe the save of the race goes to Spain as they hold on for third place. And once again, it is Australia and Tom Slingsby. They get the win. Australia sail GP team make it two for two. The defending champions pick it up right where they left off. Japan in second. Great finish for Nathan Adderidge to go along with his third place performance in race number one. Spain finishes them third. France, Denmark, and the USA dropping down to six after their fourth in race number one. They're going to be looking for something big in the third and final race. Great Britain and New Zealand. Who would have thought those last three would be in those positions here in any race. So the fleet now takes a moment to catch their breath. They'll regroup, do some small intel as we are able now to go on board with Japan Sail GP team and their helmsman, Nathan Outridge. Nathan, uh, that was quite a race. You guys finished third in the first race, but second in the second race. It seems like you're building towards something special here for the third and final race. Yeah, Todd, um, yeah, it was a good race. It's a quite a good race course out here. It's just fantastic to be in Bermuda. And uh, that start for us was way better. Um, the first start wasn't so good, and we had to fight our way through. But that one, it was Japan and Australia back in the front, like season one, and we had a lot of fun in that race and looking forward to some more racing today. Nathan, you've got some new faces on board, but some familiar ones. You've got, of course, Chris Draper, your good friend and broadcast partner in the 2017 America's Cup. You guys seem to be gelling right now, really only in the second race. What do you need to do in this third and final race to keep that momentum going forward to day number two? Yeah, no, it's good to have some um, some guys that you know and trust on board. And sailing with Chris Drape is fantastic. And Francesco Bruni have really added to our team a lot from season one, so it's been great. I think moving forward, we just need to, again, get another clean start and um, sail our own boat. You, know, you can see there's a lot of mistakes on the race course. And if we can just sail clean, um, that's, the, that's all that we can really target today. I think the Australians are sailing really well. And um, obviously... We just need another top three and, and keep the points coming and get ready for um, tomorrow. Cheers, Nathan. Thanks for your time. Good luck in race three. Well, due to COVID-19 protocol, Sail GP is not running its normal spectator and hospitality programs. However, the Bermudian government is allowing families to come to the water in their own boats. So those folks having maybe the best seat in the house. Still to come, the third and final race from day number one. The moment foiling began, they realized that reflexes are a bit more important in that instinct and growing up sailing fast boats. Different sizes for different wind speeds. The bigger the wing, the more power, the bigger your jumps. The cool thing about it is, is that you can spend as much or as little as you want and have a lot of fun. We don't have access to the boats right now, and I am a person who just needs to be on the water at least five times a week, otherwise I go insane. Thankfully, I met a couple of people just before the lockdown began, and they were into foiling windsurfing. And it's right up my alley. You know, it foils, it's difficult, it's fast. And it's very similar to the moth class, which is this really cool development class that really pushed foiling into sailing. You know, you're standing on the board, you, everything is connected between your hands on the boom and your feet on the board, and it's all very low tech. You know, there's no computer assistance, it's just you and the equipment and just go and make it happen. So the way that the foiling works on these boards is that you've got the front wing here, which generates all the lift, and then we've got the, t the stabiliser, which does what it says, it stabilises it. So you're getting lift here, and this is actually sucking, it's doing the opposite. So they kind of fight each other a bit. 
and that's how you get stability. You know, I've become slightly obsessed with it. I think it is definitely going to help me in the long run. It's interesting, I've seen a lot of other people buying very similar equipment doing similar things and there's plenty of online banter about who's going to be the best when we get to bring all our toys to the next RGP event. Well, here we are, back on board the Australian boat. Winners of the two races, under four minutes until the start of race three, and a little chance for us to have a look at the highlights yeah. from race two here. Yeah. Once again, the start proved absolutely crucial. 15 aye, aye. seconds to go, and it was Nathan Outridge and his Japanese crew with a very clear plan at the closer end of the start line to us. But at the bottom, once again, street fighting and reacting very last minute was Tom Slingsby. Thought Slingsby forced his way in again. That's two in a row where he's done a good job of making very critical decisions. His timing was perfect. And Outridge, that was a really, really calm start from Nathan Outridge. But at either end of the line, it was purely who hit the line on time at full speed. So I love that start. Calm planning from Outeridge, street fighting reaction work from Tom Slingsby. And those two boats dominated this reach to mark number one. Both boats already out ahead and making clear plans of what was to come as we saw the boat streak along this reach here. And it, what it did was it left Tom Slingsby with good control able to sail the boat as we know they can, fast and smooth. It's very much many people working together on the boat. There's Tom Slingsby, Kyle Langford, Jason Waterhouse. They've had a lot of time together in the boat now, and it's like the three of them are driving the car, one doing the pedals, one doing the gear stick, and one doing the steering wheel. And that work together needs to be so well done. Well, there you see the fans lucky enough to have their own boats socially distanced here in the Great Sound as they get ready for the third and final race here on day one. Sail Grand Prix presented by Hamilton Princess here in the beautiful waters of Bermuda. Todd Harris, Stevie Morrison, Freddie Carr, and Allie Vance with you as we get set for the third and final race. Really, guys, day one has been dominated by Australia. Dominated by Australia, but also you've seen some other boats fly up the leaderboard that you wouldn't necessarily have seen the french and the spanish have had fantastic days so far just an absolute beautiful shot as we get ready for race three the final race of the day here at bermuda sail grand prix presented by hamilton princess well, I'll tell you what, the Australians could not have scripted it any better, Stevie, Freddie. They have looked sharp from the get-go. Their starts have been the key, and they have not had to come back through the fleet because, as Nathan Outer just talked about, guys, once you're in the back with the talent that's in front of you and seven boats, it's almost impossible to find those passing lanes. Suddenly, all things shut down when you're at the back of the fleet, don't they, Freddie? You're just completely out of options really, really quickly here, and that's what makes the start so crucial. 56 seconds to go here. The French trying to dive in on a gap there very tight on board the french boat there small crash on board things there let's hope there's no damage really tight moment besson diving in there umpire coming on this is the umpire's uh penalty penalty uh france penalty france relative denmark here we go penalty, penalty to france, france relative, relative to denmark. denmark look at him dive inside no, there besson how is the danish no, team supposed to get out of the way what yet. a maneuver from besson they're the going to need to refocus here here we go we're coming back just 19 back seconds to go to up. the start and i can already see tom slingsby and nathan outridge coming in here onto the start with just 11 seconds to go here slightly confused on board at the moment it's going to be about last minute outridge and Slingsby at the top of the line, three seconds to go. It looks like Slingsby's timed it well again. It's Slingsby across the line first, leading away. Ben Ainsley and his British crew, great start out the middle of the line. And the New Zealand team of Peter Burling, that's a little bit more we're used to seeing there. Ben Ainsley back off the start line. Great work from the British crew there. And he should have control as we move into mark number one.
So it's a high-speed drag race to mark number one. Who's going to get there first? And a much better start for Ben Ainsley in Great Britain. Mark number one. It's Great, great Britain and Ben Ainsley around first. Tom Slingsby in second place. And Peter Burling dives in in third place there. Ben Ainsley now, he's got a chance to make a very clear plan as we head down when we're on board with Tom Slingsby. Second place at this point. That was a very clear jive on board the Australian boat there. That was some slick work from the Australian crew out in front of the, the New Zealand crew. Ben Ainsley, well, the British crew, they touched the water there. That wasn't perfect. Small gain for Slingsby. And in the background, Outridge has had to jive away in seventh place. Not the best start for the Japanese crew there, but it's Peter Burling and his New Zealand crew now. They're in this race, but they've dropped from third to fifth already. Just not quite tight enough on their manoeuvres. And at this stage, they're going to be planning ahead to the gate. Anticipate a left turn for the leading boats. We've often seen a little bit more wind out on the right-hand side of the course. Left turn at the bottom. It's going to take you towards more wind. Here comes to Ben Ainsley, Tom Slingsby. And once again on that right-hand side, there's a little bit less land mass on that side. Great opportunity for the teams to attack. And in fact, just Jimmy Spittle there up to third place. Great rounding from Spittle. But it's the Australians first to blink as they tack away from Ainsley, looking for clear air. Nice tack, that, Freddy. It's very nice tack. I'm judging that tack on the new lured hull. So as you look at it, the hull on the right-hand side of the screen didn't touch the water, and there was no violent movement as they landed on the new board. Superb flight control by Luke Parkinson. That's what we want to see, really. We expect that of this British crew. Look how stable that platform is. They want the boat heeling towards them. They want the boat slightly tipped towards them. We're on board now of Sir Ben Ainsley communicating in Jensen on the wing Luke Parkinson the West Australian loves flying these boats high but needs to maybe be a bit more average today and keep the boat fast and we're talking about healing it towards them I'm looking right now and the Brits have got one degree of heel towards them that's a really nice number that powers up the boat beautifully and that's why the Brits have got a nice lick of speed on this first upwind nice speed look at that hundred meter gain the British are boosting away from the fleet here Todd what a performance by Ben Ainsley out of the top three in race one, finishing in seventh in race number two, and now an opportunity here in race three to get the top spot and 10 points. And guys, let's not forget, as we get to day number two, that final race, that podium race, you definitely want to be in that. That's right, it's a long regatta here, and someone like Ben Ainsley will know you don't always have to start fast. You need to win the final tomorrow afternoon to win the event here in Bermuda. But uncharacteristically, Sir Ben Ainsley and his crew will be thinking about having to get to that final at the moment because they've not had the best start to things, but there's no better way of going about it than getting back and winning the last race of the day. Ben Ainsley setting up attack on the Australians here. Should be able to block the wind of the Australians, choke their fuel pipe all the way in. Expect two tacks in a row. Australia, then Great Britain. This is going to hurt the Australian crew here, Freddie. Good opportunity for the Americans and Spittle. Can he get back into the race, Freddie Carr? Well, as the Brits went over there to cover the Australians, it really did open up the, do the door there for the Spanish and uh, the Americans coming in from the left-hand side of the course. We're coming into yeah. gate number three here. It's Sir Ben Ainsley in control, but Tom Slingsby, he just will not go away. Can Phil Robertson squeeze round the mark in second place ahead of Australia? I don't think so. His speed's slow because he's trying to steal a bit of distance in there, and it's going to be Sir Ben Ainsley and the great British team round first. Australia and Slingsby in second, and third place for Phil Robertson. This race is going to go all the way to the end, though. This is no chance for mistake at the moment. Sail the boat fast on the edge. I'm surprised how much Jimmy Spittle and his American crew lost at the top of that beach. Real sign that it's very shifty, and that means this race has got a lot to play. 
Spain Sale GP team coming off a third place finish in a race number two. Phil Robertson, Florentin, Florian Trittel, the youngest squad in the fleet, shown they've shown great improvement here. So if they could get a top three again in race number three, that would be huge. Here we go. Nice gust here, Nate. Go down quick. That's the voice of Chris Draper there, talking about the wind coming onto the boat for Nathan Outridge. Constant communication, communication, sorry, is required to sail these boats smoothly. Here we jive. What are we thinking here, Freddie? We like that left turn at the bottom if you're Ben Ainsley, don't we? We've seen better wind that side. It seems like that left turn in the bottom right-hand corner has got a nice bit of wind stacked up there. And if you're in the lead, you can dictate how you get to the bottom of the course. So I'd expect Ainsley to do one jibe, maybe a jibe roundup, and get into the bottom nice stand corrected. It looks like they're on ley line and going to head out to the right-hand side. Going to be tight here. Possibly one more jibe for Great Britain. I like where Slingsby is here. Slingsby's got the inside at the bottom mark here. Could be a sharp jibe for Slingsby. It's going to be really tight. No, he dips behind. Great line. Last minute decision by Slingsby. Here we go, the two boats split the course. It's absolutely neck and neck, but I like where Tom Slingsby's heading. For me, good call by Slingsby, heading to better breeze. And Sir Ben Ainsley, has he seen something we haven't? Because I love what Slingsby's done. And it looks like Spain and the USA like what Slingsby's done as well as they're going to follow him to that side of the course. So a roll of the dice right now for Sir Ben Ainsley, who's in desperate need of points for his squad here in race three. Well, this is the final up win leg of the race, and this is the last chance for these teams to make a move, Freddie. And I'm looking at the wind speeds on the boat from Australia and Great Britain right now. The Australians have 35 kilometers an hour, and the British only have 30. More wind speed translates into more boat speed. The right-hand side has got more wind speed. Could be a good call by Tom Slingsby then. We're moving up wind here nicely. The boat's pushing right out to that right-hand boundary. They obviously like what they see there. And this cross, there we go. Look at that, Freddie. We're not as stupid as we sound. That's a gain for Tom Slingsby. He's moved into the lead. Great tactical decision making from Slingsby what can Ainsley do next we know the next half of this upwind is very shifty opportunity is out there Todd this race is still not over despite the fact we're coming into the last four or five minutes of it well especially what we saw in the second race on that last rounding by Denmark and Spain so everything left to play for here and if you're Australia you are doing no wrong winners of race one and two that's a lovely tack by the Australians. They're used to being out in front and they're sailing this boat nicely, Freddie. Sailing the boat really nicely. I'm going to get a little bit geeky here. The rudder differential, which means the difference between the two rudders, sucking and lifting, is the same. The camber in the wing between the Brits is the same, and the wing twist is the same. This is a tactical race. Tactical one on starboard tack with the right of way. It's Sir Ben Ainsley. There does seem to be more wind that side as the Australians dip behind. It's another lead change on this upwind leg. Once again, Sir Ben Ainsley finding more wind this side. That surely means, as we come to the top, Advantage Slingsby as he's sailing towards more wind. There's five metres in it with just 300 metres to go until this final upwind gate. It's going to come down to who finds a gust in these last few minutes. And so Ben Ainsley looks like he's got something there at over 60 kilometres an hour. Big angle change for Sir Ben Ainsley there. He's turned away, but now he uses that to his advantage. Tack towards the mast, potentially going to save some distance here. This could be a masterful move from Ainsley, but he is on port tack. Wind coming from the left-hand side of the boat. If Australia's close, that's going to mean that he has to keep out of his way. But no, Sir Ben Ainsley, well, he's found something from nowhere, and he's crosses ahead, but I think they're going to split the gate at exactly the same time again. Any mistakes now, and this race is done. I like where Tom Slingsby's turning. He leads for me around the gate number five, and it's all about the downwind's leg here. Who's going to push hardest? How do you sail these boats fast down here, Fred? 
identical bearaways there. Really high pressure moment in the race for the pilots as they go from low speed upwind to high speed downwind. And both Waterhouse and Parkinson nailed those bearaways, setting up a crucial jibe on each boundary. We know Luke Parkinson, he loves to fly the boat high. The higher you fly the boat, the faster you go, but the more on the edge you are. I can guarantee you Luke Parkinson will be pushing this to the absolute limit. Let's hope he doesn't push it too far. And just All like right. that, Spain has given up two positions, so they drop now Be back done. to fifth as the USA Jump. and Japan right. gets past them. But the race, guys, really is on for first and second. Australia, winners of race one and two, That's looking for the clean run. sweep today on day one here at Bermuda Sail Grand Prix, on presented by Hamilton right. Princess. But Great Britain and Sir Bain Ainsley seem to have found their legs here on this final race today. They're definitely nice split down here at the moment. Looks like a good move for Slingsby, but they've both got a couple more manoeuvres to do here at the bottom. Potentially two jibes for Australia. Ben Ainsley can perhaps get in with just one more jibe. Tactically, the advantage sits with Slingsby, but there is still an opportunity for Ainsley at the bottom and expect Slingsby to try and lock this race down now and close out the British crew. No, at the moment it looks like Slingsby, oh, that's and my bad call there. Slingsby's three. managed to get the boat right. down. There was no opportunity for Ainsley. That must have been a magical mode that Carl Langford found with that big wing sail because he yep. didn't look like he was making the game for a while. And at gate number six, could this be three from three? Wow, what a comeback to Sail GP. He's had a year to think about the beating he took from Ben Ainsley in Sydney and what a way to turn it around and deal with it. Pure class from Tom Slingsby, Carl Langford, Jason Waterhouse, Sam Newton. And on board the Australian boat here as they cross the finish line in first place. That's three from three. What a performance there. And that's high fives and now well-deserved high fives. A clean sweep for Australia Sail GP team with Tom Slingsby at the helm. Great Britain comes through off of that seventh finish in race number two. So a big push up the ladder for them into second place. And it looks like the Americans are going to hold on for third. But guys, what can you say? Tom Slingsby, you touched on it, Stevie. After that beat down, you know Slingsby was not happy about what Ainsley got done on their home waters. And he repaid him right here in Bermuda. It was a really, really tight race. It's a nice comeback from Jimmy Spittle in this race. Got himself up through to third. He had a very dodgy moment in the middle of the race. They won't have enjoyed that. And for me, probably the guy most under the pressure at the beginning of the day was Billy Besson, the French skipper. He's really not performed as we can expect. But if he can keep ahead of Japan on this sprint to the finish here, it's going to be third place for Jimmy Spittle and the USA crew. But on board France, Billy Besson with that new addition to the crew, Lee McMillan. I think they're going to come away from today really quite happy. They'll have answered a few critics, me amongst them. And that's there. Coming across now in fifth, Japan, Nathan Outridge. Solid, if not spectacular day for the Japanese. Well, the consistency award of the day goes to Australia, but you've talked about France. Remember, race one, they got second, fourth in race two, and fourth in race three. For Japan, it was third in race number one, a second in race two, and a fifth in race three. Well, and here we go, the sprint to the finish. Here we see Todd the Danes pushing hard in here, but at the back of the picture, that's not something anyone in the sailing community expected. They came in with the tag of the greatest sailors on the planet, the Kiwis, Burling and Toot. Well, they're new to these boats, but there's a lot of crews that haven't had a lot of time in these boats out here, and they're going to need to go ashore tonight and have a very, very serious debriefing because for Peter Burling and Blair Toot and that crew to be finishing back in eighth place, well, that's something none of us expected. Not only finished in eighth place in the final race today, but they finished in eighth on race two as well, behind Great Britain. And as you pointed out, though, they're probably the least amount of time on this boat, so they will figure it out. Two of the best sailors in the world, of course, coming off that tremendous campaign to defend the America's Cup in Auckland earlier this season.
So three races up, three races down. Australia with the win in all three. So day one is complete as we take a look at the final results. Race number three, once again, it's Australia getting the max points, 10. Ben Ainsley comes back, and Great Britain gets second. The USA finishing in third with France, Japan, Spain, Denmark, and big surprise, New Zealand in eighth place. And while we have an opportunity, let's talk with the man and his team, Tom Slingsby, getting it done three races in a row. Yeah, it's a great day. Hey, Tom, what a performance there. Disappointing result in Sydney. That seems a long time ago now after three first places today. What was the secret to your performance out there today? Oh, I don't know if there was a secret. It was more just uh, avoid the carnage and... I think by getting good starts, we uh, were able to stay out of the pack and a couple of times I turned around and had a, and watched the carnage going on behind me and I was glad I wasn't a part of it. Yeah, it certainly looked very tight back down the fleet there, but you seem to be reading the wind shifts pretty well. Was it wind shifts or was it finding more wind that was the key to the performance today? Uh, for sure, we, we fell in sync with the shifts a couple of times there, like we didn't boundary tack and we just thought we were on a shift and we tacked early and tried to piece together a few wind shifts. Uh, and then I think we'll just clean. Uh, we didn't make too many errors. We had a couple of bad tacks here and there, but we recovered from them really quickly. So really good job by the team. Yeah, it must feel pretty good sailing in after uh, Ainsley, Burling, Spittle, Outridge, all of them trailing in your wake all day. Fantastic performance. I'm sure there'll be a lot for you guys to learn overnight. And uh, thanks very much and good luck tomorrow, mate. Yes, thank you very much. So congratulations once again to Tom Slingsby and Australia Sail GP team as they win all three races on day one as the 2021 season of Sail GP gets underway. Wow. So hold your breath. That's just day one. Day two coming tomorrow from the beautiful Great Sound here in Bermuda. On behalf of Stevie Morrison, Freddie Carr, and Ali Vance, I'm Todd Harris saying so long for now. Once again, it's Australia winning races one, two, and three for a dominant lead. All 30 points going the way of the defending champion Australians and they'll come back and try to do it again. Until then, we will see you. I'm Todd Harris, signing off for now.